Hey na Degul. Welcome to a new video lesson. Today I will discuss and give you an analysis of the prefaces and the first two chapters of Gulliver's Travels, Part One: A Voyage to Lilliput. So let's begin. Before the starting of the text of Gulliver's Travels, there are two prefaces. The first preface is by Richard Simpson and is titled The Publisher to the Reader. In this preface, Richard Simpson introduces the book as papers left with him by his friend Lemuel Gulliver. He gives a brief description about him. Simpson vouches for and I quote an air of truth about the text and attests to Gulliver's honesty. Simpson explains he is publishing an edited version of uh, the papers left to him for pe people's entertainment. His edits have constituted of cutting out passages about the sea travels and geographical informations which he thinks would go above the head of the common reader as they have gone above his. The importance of Simpson's prefatory letter is huge because it is one of Swift's many tactics to make the book seem like a true travel account rather than a piece of fiction. The letter not only refers to Gulliver as a real person, it also vouches for his honesty and truthfulness of the subsequent account. The letter also defends the book's vagueness about geographical facts. The reader um, would most likely assume there, um, there aren't any facts uh, because the travels are just uh, fantasies, yet this letter claims the facts do exist and were only omitted to save the reader from boredom of reading them. Okay, but this preface has a uh, is followed by a second preface, which is titled "A Letter from Captain Gulliver to His Cousin Simpson," written in year 1727. Uh, I would like to remind you that Gulliver's Travels was published in 1726. Okay. Um, this letter, in this letter, uh, in this uh, preface, it, it was dated April 2nd, 1727. In this letter, uh, the content deals with Gulliver is furious with Simpson's edits of his book protesting Simpson's adjustment to his story, especially the addition of a passage praising the English Queen. Though Gulliver says uh, he respects the Queen, he insists he never have praised her to Winums. He complains to the Simpson has muddled the details of his sea travel. He calls the book Livius, that is defamatory. He has received a great deal of abuse for the book and everyone doubts the veracity of the account. Okay, so this letter introduces a theme of perspective, which we will sh uh, see in the text itself. This letter introduces the theme of perspective. Though Simpson has just expressed his edition of the text, Gulliver is furious with his edits, but accusing Simpson of falsification is furious uh, uh, by accusing Simpson of the falsification and li libel. This letter not only calls the truth of Simpson's letter into question, it also implies the text to come is itself uh, somehow untrue while also therefore some part of the narrative is true also. Through the confrontation between uh, Simpson and Gulliver, 
in through the different prefaces this letter adds a sense of reality it tries to add a sense of reality which was tried to be shown through the previous letter also so now we will get into the chapter 1 of part 1 that is a voyage to lilliput chapter 1 of part 1 is titled a the, the part 1 is titled a voyage to lilliput chapter 1 deals with some background details in this uh, text galiver in this chapter galiver recounts his modest circumstances and his background as a surgeon and then as a ship surgeon he gives a, some account of himself his family uh, his first inducement to tra- inducement to travels uh, and all this his education he uh, he also says that he he married mrs mary barton second daughter of mr edmund barton he established a business which failed then he worked successively in two ships uh, in several voyages for uh, six years but the income was not much satisfactory so he at last accepted an advantageous offer from captain william preachard uh, who who was a master of the ship antelope um, they were going for the voyage to the south sea and they set sail from bristol on may 4 1699 the voyage was quite prosperous until um, they reached Uh, 2 degrees the south of van diem's land northwest of van diem's land so on 5th november which was in those parts the beginning of the summer there was some troubles they faced and the trouble led the six of the crew men of whom gulliver was one they were let down the boat into the sea Uh, they never tr- uh, they n- never trusted uh, themselves they were left at the mercy of the waves what happened was that they were thrown apart he says that he swam as fortune directed him and pushed forward by the and was pushed forward by the wind and tide he often left his uh, legs drop to feel whether there is any bottom um, or not but he could not feel any after uh, some time by and the storm had um, subsided he he reached the land he walked a mile before he could go to the shore it was uh, he conjectured it was somewhat 8 uh, o'clock in the evening he moved around he, he could not discover any signs of houses or inhabitants over on the shore so as um, because of the tiredness that uh, he was feeling he was much inclined to sleep and when he woke up it was somewhat uh, a kind of somewhat 9 hours gap in between when he tried to uh, raise from his position he saw he found out that his arms and legs were strongly fastened on either side similarly his hairs were also fastened and he felt that something alive was moving on his left leg he saw that it was somewhat um uh, human creature like thing not 6 inches high with bow and arrow in his hands a quiver at his back and at least somewhat 40 same kind of people were following him he was um told afterwards that uh, he was tied down 
and they were shouting they were shouting hekina degul h e k i n a h d e g u l hekina degul he had the fortune of breaking the strings and seeing some of the uh, things here G- galiver uh, introduces some of the phrases that were um, that have no meaning actually he saw hundred of arrows discharged on his left hand which shot like which was shot in the air as uh, he compares it with the throwing of bombs in europe he says that he could easily free himself he could have easily freed himself but he did not he believed in helping it out through talking terms he saw a stage was erected somewhat about a um, foot and a half from the ground and capable of holding four of the inhabitants four of the lilliputians with two or three ladders to mount it uh, when one of them who seemed to be a person of quality made a long speech which he did not understood a syllable and he said lagro dehun san following these words the other 50 of the inhabitants came and cut those strings somewhat longer uh, they were not very uh, powerful enough in front of galiver but still galiver did not show his physical power i will come back to that uh, why he is not using um, force but why galiver is not presenting in why swift is not presenting galiver in such a way where he can and use his physical force to destroy all the lilliputians who are some are 6 inches tall he said that he he used different languages but none of the languages could be understood by the lilliputians he put um, he made some gestures uh, frequently to the mouth to signify that he wanted food and the king the important person that was the king of lilliputians was kind enough to make them to uh, order the other lilliputians the workers to bring foods for him they brought food for him he made they were flesh of several animals two or three at a mouthful they put up and uh, they put up ladders to his mouth so they can and put it and put all of the meat into galiver's mouth then he made another sign uh, of that he wanted to drink he ate that it tasted small wine of burgundy and when and he had drank all this they again uh, shouted hekina degul he confesses that um, he was tempted while they were passing backwards and forwards on his body that he was tempted to seize 40 or 50 of them at a chance that came in his reach and dash them against the ground but he did not do that he believed to promise of honor that he made them beside he considered uh, himself to be bound by the laws of hospitality to the people who have treated him with so expense and magnificence he desired um, of his liberty show that he must be care uh, but the Uh, king said that he must be carried as a prisoner as if it would satisfy uh, his power when he was being carried or when this order was made rather some ointment some sort of ointment of pleasant smell was put on his left hand so that it removed all the smart of their arrows on him 
and he also felt that they had mingled uh, some sleepy potion in the hog's head of wine so he felt a uh, quite sleepy in the meantime uh, he discovered uh, on sleeping on the grounds after his landing he had felt uh, he had slept a lot the plenty of meat and drink should be sent to me and a machine prepared to carry him to the capital city a machine was prepared to carry him to the capital city this resolution <coughs> was a bit dangerous this appear this perhaps may appear very bold and dangerous what he says he says that i am confident would not be imitated by any prince in europe on the like occasion what does he do over here he is constantly comparing he is constantly comparing the situation he is constantly comparing the situation of the lilliputians where a giant size person has visited with a situation of europe because this is a satire on the political conditions this is a satire on the political uh, situation in europe and specially in england whatever uh, this shows that they were great excellent mathematicians they were go perfectionist in mechanics and everything uh, five they were great carpenters 500 carpenters and engineers were immediately set to work to prepare the greatest engine um, and he was crazed he was raised and slung into the engine 1500 of the emperor's largest horses each of somewhat 4 uh, inches tall carried him carried him um, a uh, somewhat a miles distance about for 4 hours they carried him Re they rested at night with 500 guards on each side next morning at sunrise uh, they continued their march and arrived within 200 years of the city's gates and having seen all these at the place the carriage stopped and stood as an at an ancient temple he describes the temple over there there were guards over him here the emperor ascends one of the over against the temple on the other side with a great highway of 20 feet distance the emperor ascended with many principal lords uh, of his court to have the opportunity of viewing me he when the workmen found it was impossible uh, for galiver to break loose they cut all the strings that bound him the chains had left his uh, left leg were about 2 yards long and gave him only the liberty of walking backwards and forwards in a semicircle Uh, but fixed within four inches of the gate, allowed to creep in and lie at the full length in the temple. This was his position. So, what does he do over here? This starts with the description of England, his background, his society, his society, and he is now positioning this into the society of the Lilliputians. Okay, so. Gulliver's description of his past distances himself from the corrupt, deceitful society of England, and gives him the high moral ground because he cannot make um, all the things that the corrupt society of England can make. He cannot use his. opinions he cannot use his means to earn much and much more but what he did what he can do he can only toil hard so he has to work in uh, the ships as a surgeon to earn living okay so the description of the youth and education provides background knowledge establishes gulliver's position in english society 
and causes the novel to resemble true life accounts of the travels at sea the same thing is done by the preface okay the style of the travel log is maintained to heighten the satire while the story is presented as a true life story of adventure on another level a purely fictional tale because when we uh, try to understand that we know that the lilliputians is nothing but a fictional narrative but what swift's original intention is swift's original intention is a satirical critique of the european pretensions to rationality and goodwill gulliver's travels was written at a time when europe was world's dominant power and england despite its small size was rising in power which brought it into contact with a wide variety of unknown people the miniature stature of the lilliputians can be interpreted as a physical incarnation of exactly this kind of cultural differences his physical strength and size put gulliver in a unique position within the lilliputian society despite gulliver's fear of the lilliputians arrows there is an element of condescension in his willingness to be held prisoner by them it is the way of destabilizing humanity's position at the center of the universe by showing that size power and significance are all relative chapter 2 begins with the description of the countryside of the lilliputian society he sees all the trees and all the places it looked like a garden with a small it looked like garden with small fields flower beds and woods and the town seemed a painted picture to gulliver so here we begin the interaction the direct interaction between gulliver with the king and the other lilliputians here he it mentions that uh, gulliver defects a discharge from the body uh, uneasy load the business in he discharged the uneasy load in open air which was carried off in wheel barrows then the prince the king comes on um horse which thor which uh, thinks gulliver uh, to be a moving mountain and reared it rears uh, up on its hinder uh, feet he then describes the king who is not who is the tallest of all the people uh, he is taller by almost the breadth of gulliver's nail than any one of the court he is taller than any one of the court his voice is shrill but very clear and articulate he describes the king several of the pre- several of the priests and lawyers were present and they were commanded to address to gulliver in their language gulliver on the other hand spoke to them in many languages he used uh, high and low dutch latin french spanish italian etc but none could be understood um many of them were impatient to in the crowd and some of them had the impudence to shoot their arrows at gulliver one of them narrowly missed his left eye they were some of them were pushed um some of them were pushed by the soldiers uh, some six of them six of them were pushed uh, by the butts and by the soldiers towards gulliver gulliver took them all in his right hand and <laughs> acted as if he was going to uh, eat them all up but he made a countenance as if he um, 
he was going to eat them all up but um, they were all terrified all the lilliputans are terrified all the six of them and when they uh, saw Gulliver take out the pen knife he put five of them in his coat pocket and one uh, in his uh, hand he took out the pen knife but he soon put them out of fear for looking mildly and immediately cutting he cut all the strings that that bound him he set him that man actually he set that man gently on the ground and uh, he ran away he treated in a similar way with the rest of the people rest of the five and this led their amuse this led to their amusement and which was represented very much in for the uh, for him in an advantageous way to the court to the court of the king so uh, 600 beds of common measure was made for him so somewhat 150 of the beds were sewn together whereby the secretaries of the state got considerable fees and they were against um, Gulliver's presence over here they say the expense of the diet would cause famine they said they wanted to starve Gulliver or shoot him in the face uh, with poisoned arrows but they again thought that the large carcass might produce a plague in the metropolis so what they thought they with the concentration several of the officer army went to the door met the council chamber and they thought what to be done later would be decided later he saw all the villages some 900 of 900 years six beeves 40 sheep uh, the uh, king commissioned the king ordered that all the villages would bring some somewhat six beeves every morning they would provide six beeves 40 sheep other victuals for his sustenance together with proportionable quality the quantity of bread and wine and other liquors uh, payment of which his majesty gave assignments upon the treasury the treasury would pay for all those things six of the um, scholars of majesty was employed to instruct in their language and he learned very quickly and the first words that he learned to express was his desire that he would would be pleased if he was given liberty okay so here he repeated this every day he repeated this every day on his knees he desired that uh, uh, take it ill and gave orders to certain proper officers to search him the the emperor ordered and uh, some of the officers to get him checked he said he was ready to strip himself and he knew he could be done without the cons and as he knew it can't be done without his uh, consent so two of the officers were put into the coat pockets to search to search everything which can which could be found out so uh, they found out so called dangerous engines his practice was to shave out of the right fob and things like they referred to a thing appeared to be a globe half silver which made incessant noise it was actually clock it was uh, they concluded that it was either some unknown animal or the god that he worships so uh, time becomes god the clock becomes god that he seldom did anything without consulting it they have observed that uh, Gulliver did anything without consulting it so as if time becomes God <laughs> he called it his oracle whatever be it similarly they found out some um, real gold must have of immense value they found a schemata schemeter sorry schemeter 
some all the things that have been found he gave up uh, i he then gave up the silver uh, and copper money um with the large pieces of gold his knife and razor the comb the silver snuff box his handkerchief and journal book the scimitar pistol pouch were conveyed in the carriages to his majesty's stores but rest of the goods were returned to him he observed therefore in one of his private pockets there was his spectacles which he used which is sometimes used for the weakness of his uh, of his eyes so galiver's pockets were searched and the contents were listed although the lilliput uh, lilliputians did not know the value or the use of these items they were taken away to be returned to him at the later date so here when he was being searched when lilliputians draw up an inventory of gulliver's possession the whole endeavor is treated as if it were a serious matter of state the contrast between the tone of the inventory and the utter triviality of the possessions uh, serves as a mockery of the people who take themselves too serious okay so here is the satire lies he constantly satire lies in the thing that there is a constantly feature a significant feature in his journey is that the traveler the european traveler is the object of scrutiny okay galiver's journeys to any place in various parts of the world and he is a european traveler who is supposed to examine the things as as in the european power but in this case all this has been subverted the european traveler is the object of scrutiny examination and study quite the reverse of the standard of the european travel narrative in the 18th century right because this is the satire this is a satire it is not gulliver who studies all the other people all the lilliputians but gulliver who is studied the wonder of the new world uh, does of course exist in gulliver's narratives uh, of his experience but more than anything else he is the object of studied wondered at the hands of the natives whether it is in this book Uh, whether it is in this part rather or in part 2 whether it is he is being observed so gulliver uh, the european traveler is not the all conquering discoverer hero he is not a discoverer in the classic sense because there are no heroics that accompany discovery okay instead gulliver's journeys or discoveries are accidental the result of errant wandering rather than planned routes so we can say that it is an anti conquest discoveries because all his discoveries are through errant wanderings right so swift satirizes the prevalent obsession with discovery and exploration when he shows the gulliver el gulliver wandering purposeless across the known and unknown world and discovering places by accident but what we see here is that like the european travelers he is not the one who is um searching others who is not the one scrutinizing others but he is being scrutinized at different places it is not a heroic moment but uh, when he can stamp his presence on the new lands impose his authority on it or declare that he has discovered them rather gulliver is gulliver's famous arrival scenes rather than cast a monarch of all i survey the image consists with discoveries natives are fraught with danger or moments of mirth 
देर इज नो वर ऑफ द न्यू वर्ल्ड द स्टीफन ग्रीन प्लेट एसोसिएट्स विद द डिस्कवरी नेरेटिव ऑफ नाइनटीन नो अथॉरिटी ऑफ डिस्कवरी इंस्टेड देर इज अ मॉकरी ऑन द पार्ट ऑफ द पीपल हु आर सपोज टू बी पैसिव एंड टू बी ऑब्जर्व बाय द यूरोपियन ओके हियर आई एंड दिस वीडियो the next chapters will be discussed in other videos thank you for listening